doing much the same thing, I think. So, right. Uh, without much ado, more ado then, uh, over to you, Lucy. And... Thank you very much, Bruce. And hello to everybody. I've actually had to turn off the gallery view because it's so overwhelming seeing everybody. And there's loads of people here from Leicestershire and Rutland, but there's also people here from all over the country, uh, people who've signed up from Twitter and Facebook, people who I know, and people who know a lot more than me, which is always scary when you're doing a talk because you think, oh no, I'm going to get that wrong and that's gonna be embarrassing. But never mind. I will hopefully keep you all entertained. The talk itself, uh, I've been to a lot of talks recently that are very highbrow, uh, very technical and very research led. This is the exact opposite of that. This is meant to be entertaining. It's meant to be fun. Um, this is all about sharing the story of 365 Days Wild and also my own love of wildlife, my life with wildlife and the catastrophes that I have had watching wildlife on my own and with my family. I know that some people here will actually have shared in some of those catastrophes. Uh, some of them are hopefully quite entertaining, some of them are very poignant and others of them are things that hopefully you'll be able to relate to in your own lives as well. So fingers crossed I can share the screen. Um, what I would say, ooh, can I move this? Come on, there we go. Sorry, it's being a touch slow. Uh, what I would say is I'm very unused to talking um, to so many people at once, as I think many of us are. And last time I tried to do a talk, which was last week, my voice actually gave way halfway through because I've not had such a sustained conversation with myself for such a long time. Um, so if I suddenly choke and grab a glass of water, don't worry, I'm fine. It's just trying to get back into the rhythm of actually talking to people is a whole new experience that I'm sure we're all going to go through at some point. Um, oh, the final thing is just a heads up thanking all of the photographers for photographs that have appeared throughout this. Um, I, I'm a terrible photographer. I can't take credit for any of these apart from the really terrible digiscoped ones. Um, so thank you if you have donated photographs and thank you to the other photographers that let me use their stuff. It's much appreciated. So um, Bruce has already given me a really lovely introduction. Um, at heart, I am a writer and a wildlife storyteller. I write for a number of different publications, including the I newspaper, BBC Wildlife. I'm a columnist for Birdwatch magazine. Um, I contributed books to the seasons anthologies that were uh, edited by Melissa Harrison. And these are two of the quotes that were said about some of my pieces in Birdwatch. Um, which I always find funny because I don't think either of them were that controversial and apparently these people don't read the Daily Mail or anything worse than that because I have had so many deeply controversial reactions to my writing uh, which I always find fun. I love talking to people about wildlife, I love chatting and discussing things, getting into the nitty-gritty of how we relate to wildlife. Um, so if you do read my stuff, thank you very much. Um, if you don't like my stuff, please don't put that in the chat box because I. I we're going to keep it positive and nice tonight but these are two of the things that have said that have stayed with me and I actually now wear as a badge of honour. So my own wildlife I fundamentally believe that a wildlife is happier and healthier and that everyone can benefit from spending more time in nature but of course everyone in this talk already knows that we are an audience that is heavily engaged with nature already and I know that so many of you Will have been relying on nature throughout lockdown uh, to benefit your own physical and mental health. But I love wildlife because I love to tell stories about it. I am a birder, I'm a twitcher occasionally, not as much now, obviously not as much in the last year, uh, but I also love going and watching whales and dolphins. Um, I love interacting with mammals in the summer. I love seeing new species of butterfly. So it really is a big picture. But uh, there are some stories in here about some truly catastrophic encounters with wildlife that we'll get to. Uh, I love to bring people of all ages closer to nature. So like Bruce said, um, I worked for the Osprey Project for a season as their education officer. And then right through to the other end of that, I love telling stories to Wildlife Trust members who are traditionally a bit older. And I love finding ways to tell creative stories about projects. One amazing project that Leicestershire and Rutland Wildlife Trust run is the Time in Nature project, which uh, relates people to 
relates people who've got dementia and their carers to wildlife at Rutland Water. And this is an incredible project that was running up until COVID started last year. And I just love finding those ways that nature brings happiness to so many different people. I want to make it accessible to everyone. And that's one of the reasons I'm doing this talk for Leicestershire and Rutland Wildlife Trust tonight. I value what the Wildlife Trusts do so much. They are so important to all our lives. And I'm sure everyone here would agree with that. The two photos you can see, uh, you have me and my mum. Um, when I was, I think, about a year old. Uh, I sadly lost my mum when I was 16, but I firmly believe that having a wildlife and discovering nature in my early 20s actually helped me to manage my own grieving process. I think it helped me manage uh, bereavement very, very seriously, played a huge part in my own mental health recovery from that. And I now take all of those feelings and I channel it into how we raise our baby girl trying to give her as much time outdoors as possible, helping her to have her own wild experiences. The whole premise of what I do is about random acts of wildness. Anyone that knows me knows that I'm really quite disorganized. Um, so I love the idea of a random act of wildness, something that's not planned, something that just comes upon you. Uh, it's a way to experience nature for a few seconds, for a few minutes, for a few hours, stopping to smell a wildflower or all the way to creating an entire area in your garden. There's all these different things that we do, different ways we experience nature using our senses, uh, tasting, smelling, touching, feeling. I think all of that is so important for our mental health and then we can carry that all the way through uh, to things that we do that are ultimately good for the environment. So things like cutting down single-use plastics, uh, using environmentally friendly toiletries and cosmetics, uh, twitching less for my sins, to cut down on my own carbon footprint. Anything like that, I think is so important to be able to, uh, sorry, there's a little line appearing on my presentation, it's very distracting. Um, and I think all of these things are so important, not just in valuing nature, but in also then taking action to save it. We all know that a little bit of nature goes a long way and that spending, out, spending time outdoors in nature is fundamentally good for us, just like eating healthily, getting exercise, Spending time in nature encourages us to be more social, it improves our confidence. I think there's this stigma around birders that we have this view from the outside world um, that we all walk around on our own and we all have very big beards and we don't talk to anyone and we're quite antisocial. But that has not been my experience of the wildlife world. I have loved the wildlife family that I feel have adopted me in the past 10 years, um, have shared in my experiences, have gone to the pub with me afterwards. Um, I have got so many friends and so many connections in this giant world of wildlife that I can say I genuinely love. So I don't believe that birders and wildlife watchers walk around by themselves being terribly introspective. I think it's a hugely social activity that we do, uh, something that we all share in and a passion that can be shared far beyond the bounds of the people we traditionally talk to. Going beyond that, um, I used to work for the Wildlife Trusts, where I was very privileged to run a campaign called 30 Days Wild. Uh, this is a campaign that essentially asks people to do something wild every day for 30 days throughout June. We set this up because we knew that nature could help people, but we wanted to prove exactly the impact that wildlife could have on people's lives. So working with the University of Derby, we teamed up to run a wildness quiz uh, that looked at mental health problems, anxiety, uh, things like um, connection to nature, how people were feeling at the time. And we ran this quiz at the beginning, the middle and the end of the campaign, essentially, all the way to two months after it had finished. And um, what the research showed was that if you did something wild every day for 30 days, you were happier, you were healthier and you were more connected to nature, not just at that point, but for months and months after you'd done it. More so than that, the people who had the biggest impact were the people who already had the lowest mental health to start with. Uh, so people who are suffering from anxiety, stress, depression, uh, PTSD, anything like that, spending time outdoors and taking part in those random acts of wildness, it isn't just good for wildlife, it's good for you. From the perspective of people who are already loving wildlife, the great news is that this is good for wildlife as well. Um, people who do random acts of wildness and people who take action for wildlife in their own lives are more 
likely to carry that through to join campaigns uh, to vote for environmentally friendly politicians, uh, to champion environmental causes and to make environmental decisions in their own lives. So I really think this is a win win big picture that we can all get stuck into. And of course, my lovely book, uh, which I know many of you will have. I'll be honest, this is probably far too entry level for the amazing people here in this talk now. You guys are already connected to nature, you come to a wildlife talk, but if you've got nieces, nephews, children, family members, neighbours, uh, people who you think, oh, well, actually, I think they might be quite interested in nature, but they might just need a bit of a helping hand. My book and others like it are a perfect little gift and a little nudge through the door that might open up their eyes to the world of wildlife as well. That is the last time I plug that, I promise. So more about my wildlife and moving on to the body of the talk. The bump that you can see before you here is the bump of a beluga whale uh, taken in the Thames back in September 2018. Um, it was very hard to photograph, I will confess, but next to it you can see a very young little girl. Georgie was born on the 20th of September 2018 and after a week of meeting and greeting all of the in-laws, uh, mother-in-law coming to stay for a few days, uh, aunties, uncles, lots of friends, we were so exhausted <laughs> um, and just wanting to get back to our roots as wildlife lovers um, that we looked at each other, saw that the beluga whale that had been reported in the Thames was still there and within half an hour we jumped in the car and we were on our way. This was Georgie's first proper wildlife experience at just seven days old. It involved a very big walk, pushing a very heavy pram and carrying all of the kit. But when we got there, it was like a carnival on the banks of the Thames. All these different people from different back backgrounds, not people with binoculars and telescopes like us, but people who had turned out from Gravesend and Grays in Essex, people who travelled from London. Uh, there was a steamboat out there where people were um, lined up on the side looking at looking for the beluga whale. This was a real moment for London um, that all came together because of one quite little cetacean to be honest that wasn't meant to be there uh, but everyone was celebrating this, everyone wanted to see it. The only depressing comment I heard on the day was someone standing with their hands on their hips and saying well it doesn't do much does it? I was expecting it to at least jump out the water or something and having to gently explain to them that it isn't sea world and that kind of thing doesn't actually happen in the Thames and that they should be very moved by this amazing animal uh, that's very lost um, but seem to be feeding quite well and I think the really lovely thing about this story is actually that this animal wasn't turned into a commodity in actual fact quite a lot was done to try and help it. So, for example, Gravesend actually cancelled their big firework display in November because the beluga whale was still there and they didn't want to disturb it. I think cetaceans, especially, and birds to a certain extent, uh, open up our eyes, open up our lives to more wildlife. And I think people are more likely to take action for those things that they can see and interact with. And this animal um, was a, a local celebrity, frankly. It was incredible um, to share. Uh, this experience with so many people and to set us off on this insane journey as a family. So the way that I've structured the rest of the talk is a top 10 tips for your own wildlife based on my own catastrophic experiences. Um, I sure many of you will have your own top 10 tips and some of you who especially know me and my husband will be nodding sagely in the background at some of them no doubt. Some of them I will just tell the story and tell what happened. Others I've got a few bits of writing around me because I'm a much better writer than I am a talker. So I will read some bits from my magazine articles um, and from the books that I've written in as well. And I hope you enjoy it. Like I said, it's not very deep. Uh, it's not very research led, um, but hopefully something entertaining that we can all relate to. A heads up on the first story. I have never told it yet without crying. <laughs> So I'm very sorry in advance. I always know it's going to happen and I can never stop myself, but there is a first time for everything. Fingers crossed I can get through the first one without sobbing. So my first top tip for experiencing wildlife and having your own wildlife is to find the good in the bad, no matter what. 
that can relate to our own mental health and that can relate to our own um, our own presence within a natural environment. Uh, that can be about when you're having a bad day, going out and experiencing wildlife yourself and feeling better. But it can also be about the wildlife itself. And apologies, the next photo is a little graphic, but is also very poignant. This is one of the sperm whales that washed up in Hunstanton and all along the east coast of Britain a few years ago. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, will remember this happening. It was big news at the time when it did. A pod of male sperm whales um, basically took the wrong turn and came into the North Sea, which is incredibly shallow. Uh, sperm whales are deep divers. They feed on things like squid. Uh, that not only provides them with their food, but also provides them with their water content as well. And basically the sea uh, into the wash and even higher than that and all the way down as low as Germany and Holland just isn't deep enough to support these animals. And once they've made that turn on their migration routes, it's highly unlikely that they're going to turn back and go the right way. We had a similar uh, incident earlier. I think it was either right at the beginning of this year or the end of last year where the same thing happened and there was a big mass stranding up in Northumberland. Uh, these things are more common than um, we would like. Uh, they are natural to a certain extent. Um, we can't help the fact that the sea is too shallow there, although there is a lot of research going on into exactly why the animals are behaving in the way they are doing. There are obviously issues around plastic pollution. Um, there are issues uh, around climate change, uh, there are issues around food availability, overfishing, etc, etc, etc. I'm aware also I've got Carl Chapman on here, so I might just pass over to Carl if anyone's got any questions about sperm whales later on, because he is one of the greatest experts I know of cetaceans. Um, this all happened on a Friday night. Uh, the whales that we knew about had started to come ashore in Hunstanton, uh, about four o'clock on the Friday night, uh, news was starting to break. And at one point there were four whales stranded on the rocks at Hunstanton. Um, it was going dark. There were lots of people in Hunstanton out on the um, out on the bank looking over at them. And the Coast Guard, the BDMLR medics uh, were present trying to help them. Three of them did manage to refloat and go back off into the wash. Sadly, they did later die. Um, but there was one that was stuck in Hunstanton and it was incredibly sad and incredibly difficult to watch. There were news cameras there. Uh, we were watching it from our home in Leicestershire and watching this incredibly poignant story unfolding as it went dark. It was freezing cold. I can't tell you how cold it was. Um, and all these people standing there sharing the pain of this animal. See, I'm already welling up. It's going to go. Um, we decided that we were going to go the next day, regardless of what we'd heard. Um, we wanted to see if the animal was still alive. And to be honest, to experience something like a sperm whale close up, whether it's alive or not, it, it's not something you get to do every day. And we were hoping beyond hope that it had managed to refloat. But at the same time, it felt a bit like a pilgrimage uh, that we owed it to this animal to go and see it if it was there. We set off very early in the morning and got to Hunstanton at pretty much first light. There was no sign of it in the original spot where they'd been filming from. Um, but as we drove down, we parked up and we became aware of this very steady stream of people, um, just a few here or there, walking up and down the beach. And we actually met Carl on the beach there as well. Um, as we got closer, you could see this thing that in a way was actually not as big as I expected it to be. Um, on the beach, the shape, with this strange arc coming out that actually was the tail that you can see there it was arched up over the beach and it almost looked like some kind of statue coming out of, of the sea. It, it, it didn't look right. And as you can see on closer inspection, the whale, of course, was sadly deceased. You can see the amount of damage that had been done by the rocks um, to its jaw. You can see how damaged it is all around the snout. This was an animal that died very sadly in distress and pain. Whilst this is an incredibly sad story, there is part of it that is the book that makes me cry that I think is very important to tell. And that is that when they, so when you, um, when they were trying to rescue the animal, there are certain whales and dolphins that you basically can't refloat because they are too big. Anything above a minke whale, you are going to struggle to refloat 
because of the weight of the animal crushing down on its own organs and because we simply don't have the equipment, especially in the UK, um, to refloat these enormous animals. Anything above a minke whale is probably not going to happen, sadly, um, unless it can get itself free. Um, when the Coast Guards realised that this was not going to happen, they stayed. Um, into the middle of the night and waited for it to die. They could have gone home, and this is what I think is so marvellous. They could have gone, they could have left, they didn't. Because that's what whales do. Whales are marvellous creatures that bring people together from everywhere. You don't have to be a marine biologist to appreciate the, the wonder of a whale. Um, we connect with them because they have culture, they have language, they have songs, um, they have societies, they have social structure, they have these amazing worlds that we can relate to so strongly. And that's why people react the way they do. It's why the Coast Guard stayed. They could have gone home and had their takeaways. They could have gone home to a glass of wine and their families to the warmth, uh, to their living rooms, to their firesides and left it. But they didn't. They stayed. And I think that is the best of human nature. And that's why I always start with this story, because it is one of the best things about people is that when we hear all these horrible stories about wildlife and things going wrong and it feels very overwhelming there is always someone there who stood up and fought and said something marvelous and did something helpful and did their best and i think that is something we should all remember and we should all celebrate in our own wild lives finding the good bits in the bad bits is so powerful and is what keeps me going um when it seems like everything's going wrong in the world when you're talking about climate change and wildlife loss, these stories are so powerful and they reach out to people and they connect people and I think they are magical. That is the last time I will get upset, I promise everything else is either hilarious or awful. Um, the next one is both. So my second tip for watching wildlife in the UK is about always being prepared and this is more one for the ladies than the gents, I shan't lie. There are certain things that men find much easier to do than women, and I'm not talking about psychology and intellectual things. Um, I am talking about physical things. And I don't know how many of you have been to Home National Nature Reserve. It's a beautiful uh, nature reserve on the North Norfolk coast. Uh, one of my favourite places to go in the spring because it's alive with birdsong and um, there's loads of things splitting around in the trees. It's warm, it's balmy, it's beautiful. However, there are other things that live at Home Dunes National Nature Reserve called Natterjack Toads. And here I will turn to my book where I tell this story. Some of you will already know what's coming, but you will understand why I say sometimes it is better for a woman to be prepared than not. Home Dunes National Nature Reserve, a beautiful spot, but sadly lacking in facilities. A leaflet helpfully indicates that the nearest toilet is at the local golf course, which is a fair walk back down and simply not an option. So I did what any naturalist would do, and I followed the path into the dark dunes, found a secluded spot and did what was necessary. Incidentally, I don't know what the law is on peeing on national nature reserves. Um, if any of you do work for Natural England, I apologise profusely. The first, first part of my strategy went to plan. Um, the latter caused something of a predicament. As I lowered myself, which is a lot more difficult for girls than boys, a very slight movement caught my eye in the sand. It was squat, dark and crawling very rapidly towards the sound of running water. I swung the light of my phone up and there before me was one of Britain's rarest amphibians, the Natterjack Toad. Paul Sterry in the Collins Complete Guide to British Animals describes the Natterjack as a charming little amphibian, but I beg to differ when it catches you with your pants down. I will concur, however, that it can reach commendable speeds and that they can disappear completely from view as they wiggle into the sand. It was like something out of an alien horror film. I squealed, the toad froze, thank goodness, and we ended up in this terrible kind of buffoned stalemate. My husband heard the scream, obviously thought the worst of his beautiful girlfriend at the time, 
what on earth happened to her in the dunes in the sand, came running over, ignored my distress and distress, and they went, oh, a natterjack toad. I was practically pushed to one side as he just sat there examining it. He was taking photos of it. Um, very excited indeed that I'd very nearly weed on one of Britain's rarest amphibians. So ladies, that is a tip. Do not go to the pub, which is the secret confession, without going to the toilet before you leave when you are on a national nature reserve, because these things do happen and not all wildlife wants to play nicely. My next story um, is far more romantic. Um, it's about exploring. I love getting outside at all times of year. However, I will confess that I do love sunshine, essentially. I love to explore in warm, balmy weather. And for that, I think the perfect setting is butterflies. Um, I love when I can go out and see butterflies, especially different kinds. And this story, obviously relates to the swallowtail butterfly. This is a piece that I wrote um, for summer anthology, uh, all about our time exploring in the Norfolk Broads. So ask a child to draw a butterfly. Chances are they won't design a little brown job, a gatekeeper or a meadow brown. Commas are a bit ragged around the edges. And what about dingy or grizzled skippers? They sound more like the name of a dodgy bar or a salt crusted old fisherman than a delicately little marked insect. Instead, let their imaginations take them on a journey through colours and shapes and textures. Add detail, make it elegant and showy and ostentatious. Perhaps you'll start to get close to the beautiful swallowtail butterfly. Butterfly watching is the perfect way to while away a fragrant hot afternoon. Butterflies love sunshine, warm, dry days, the kind associated with sipping pims in the back garden, mowing the lawn, barbecues on the patio, and the slightly flat notes of an approaching ice cream van. These particular butterflies happen to inhabit very beautiful places too. Swallowtails are one of our rarest butterflies, making their home in small pockets of the vast and waterlogged Norfolk Broads. Their range is restricted in the UK by the availability of milk parsley on which they lay their eggs, and their habitat has diminished over the years. Strumshaw Fen, Hickling Broad and Ranworth Broad remain strongholds. Begin your wander through the woodlands. Investigate sunlit clearings where the earth is dappled with gold, warm and sheltered and safe. You're not just looking for swallowtails, of course. A black beauty takes to the air and drifts atop the brambles. The white admiral stands out from the same, uh, with the same timelessness of a little black dress with just a simple white band across the wings. Understated and classic. Chocolate coloured Norfolk hawker dragonflies prowl along the edge of the water, while stately emperors roam imposingly. Chasers, darters and skimmers skirt merrily across the water's surface and the banded demoiselle abounds. Explore the wildflower beds, rich in pollen and buzzing with bees. Another movement, this one though is the quintessential buddleia butterfly, the peacock. Like a real peacock, it's flamboyant enough, large ruby red with a spectacular pattern of blue purple eyes on the wings. The afternoon may be wearing on, but don't despair. The swallowtail will not be rushed. It'll take to the wing when it's good and ready. Lean against the wood, wooden boardwalks and cast your eye over the tangled bed of nettles, grasses and summer wildflowers. Something catches your eye. A large, larger than expected, shape lifts languidly into the air. The peacock makes a random flight as if suddenly startled. The white admiral goes gliding across the clearing with scarcely a flap of the wing. This creature is larger and more powerful. It skims across the top of the vegetation before dropping onto a flower, almost out of sight. This is the butterfly of a child's imagination. Almost 10 centimetres across, the black borders of the wings slope gently backwards as it perches. A golden creamy yellow fills the centre and the tail curves down elegantly into two points, like a swallow's tail. It's exquisitely shaded in midnight blue, as if by an artist's hand, and a large red dot sits in the centre. Before long, the butterflies have settled and it's time to move on. The sun is hot and it's a fair walk back. A grasshopper warbler starts singing up again, acting as a guide. You've definitely earned that glass of pims. And if they are there, a big shout out to Chris and Alison who shared that experience with me and who then provided the pims afterwards, which was very much appreciated. So my next story, um, I'm sure many of you will actually relate to bird ringers, particularly, I think, in this. 
I think as wildlife lovers, um, especially bird people, we end up kind of collecting wildlife sometimes that we don't always want. Uh, this has happened to me a few times where like neighbours have knocked on the door holding a hedgehog and it's absolutely fine. It, it's a hedgehog, but it, take the hedgehog as if I'm supposed to know what to do with it. Uh, we get starlings handed to us. We get sparrows handed to us. We also get a lot of dead things handed to us. Um, we have a dead weasel in our freezer for some reason that someone thought we might like because wildlife lovers like that sort of thing, apparently. Um, and nature isn't always that grateful for being picked up, handled and passed around. Uh, sometimes it does appear to be a little ungrateful, especially grey squirrels, which are, I know, a very divisive species. This story comes, oh, I think it was at the end of October, so prime twitching season. There was an eastern crowned warbler up in the northeast, and this was a tick for my twitchy husband and he was absolutely desperate to see it. I have a feeling it was the day before my birthday, although I may have got mixed up on my dates there. Um, I was at my house in Market Bosworth. Uh, he was at his house in Long Clawson and the plan was I was going to drive over to him uh, and then we were going to drive up together to see the Eastern Crown Warbler. Great plan, all working fine so far. Uh, for those of you that know Leicester, um, I was coming out of Kirby Muxlow, heading towards the A46, towards kind of Bronston area. And as we were going round the big corner, the big sweeping bend that takes you over the M1 and the A46, uh, the traffic suddenly slowed. And up ahead of me, I could see that cars were pulling out to swerve around something on the road. Uh, as I got closer, I realised that this was a great a grey squirrel that had obviously been clipped by a car. Um, it was still alive, it was very much alive, um, but it was in the road and frankly we were on a blind bend and it was going to cause an accident. Now I know the hardcore amongst you are sitting there going, run it over. Um, I'm not quite that bad yet, I, 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 sorry I don't have it in me. Um, so I did what any compassionate but sensible naturalist would do who also wanted to save everybody's time in rush hour. I stuck my hazards on, jumped out the car and I went to pick up the squirrel. All I was going to do was move the squirrel onto the side of the road. There are trees there. If it was going to survive, it could survive. It could get taken by a kestrel or a buzzard. That's fine. Um, or it could carry on living its life happily or it might be too badly injured. But that was the extent of my commitment to this animal. Just as I was doing this, another lady pulled up behind me and I was thinking, oh God, she's going to shout at me because I stopped the traffic. And she leapt out of the car and effusively shouted, you've just restored my faith in humanity. At which point I realised that I was far more committed to this than I now wanted to be. I didn't think I could turn around to this lovely lady and say, well, sorry, but I'm actually just going to leave it here. And before I could do anything, I was holding the squirrel in my hat because it was the only thing I had to actually hold it with. Before I could do anything, she shouted, I know where there's a vet, follow me jumped in her car and started to drive off and I was thinking oh god what do I, I I'm committed but Rob is going mental because there's an eastern crown warbler oh goodness this is just, this can't get any worse it gets worse I decided that I would follow her I put the grey squirrel in the uh, footwell of the car um, it was a little bit bloody around the nose, it didn't seem very lively, but unfortunately as I turned the engine on I'd forgotten that I'd left my music on very very loudly. Um, as I turned the engine on the music came blaring in and the squirrel literally hit the roof. It turned out the squirrel was very much just dazed. It was fine otherwise. I then spent the next five minutes driving to the RSPCA centre who I knew would not take this squirrel off me. Um, pulled in through the gates just as they were opening and as I popped up the squirrel which was doing laps around the inside of my car ended up sitting on the steering wheel with its paws facing me and it honestly I was like it's going to go for my face it is about to mug me so I, I basically grabbed it tried to get it back in the hat didn't work and I ended up with it hanging off my finger um it wouldn't let go, so I had to walk into the RSPCA where the lady had already run in and she turned around and looked at me and said, we don't take squirrels. And I was like, take this squirrel off my finger now. And the, the lady just left. 
she 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 had done her bit so the lovely lady that got me into this situation left gone forever never saw her again um the rspca refused to take the squirrel but they did give me a box um they did give me some antiseptic which was very nice of them and then off we went um to the vets around the corner and i don't know what the vets around the corner did to the squirrel at this point i i was done i was out of this conversation uh they took the squirrel off me rob is at this point phoning me going where are you you've left 45 minutes ago and me going oh no i'm going to be in so much trouble because i got to his house and basically immediately had to say i've got to go to the doctors and he said why and i said because i've just been bit by a squirrel I then had to tell this story in front of an entire packed doctor's surgery with the receptionist falling around laughing, thinking this was the funniest thing they'd ever heard, wanted proof of the squirrel. I had blood all over my hand and eventually managed to convince them to give me a tetanus jab. I almost couldn't use my binoculars because my finger was that swollen. I couldn't actually use the focusing wheel properly. And basically this squirrel, I think, nearly caused a divorce. Um, Rob wasn't happy. I wasn't particularly happy. But just to clarify, nature is not always grateful for your intervention. And those of you thinking she should have run it over were probably right. <coughs> On the other side of that, we do, of course, get to work with some amazing animals. And this is a short-eared owl uh, that I got to rescue on the Isles of Scilly this November. Uh, just gone, um, take it up to the vets where it was rehabilitated and then released, I think. Um, so there are good stories as well where the wildlife doesn't actually try and kill you for trying to help it. Uh, so I always try and remember not to give up. Nature can be grateful in some respects, just maybe not grey squirrels. So celebrate the little things. And this is one that I'm sure so many people will relate to. There are so many wildlife experiences uh, that mark the changing of the seasons, the little things. Right now, I think for so many people, it's snowdrops. The eruption of the snowdrops everywhere tells us that winter is nearly done. And this year, more than ever, that's symbolic because it means that we are moving forward um, as a society, as a country. We're moving forward with COVID vaccinations and hopefully we're moving forward into a better place for the coming year. Those little things are so important. And I remember very clearly last year in lockdown, um, it got to May and we have some house martins that nest on our house and they still weren't back. And this was really quite upsetting, actually. Um, there were no house martins anywhere on our street and a lot of people around us hadn't had theirs back either. We couldn't figure out what happened. Had they got stuck on route back from Africa? <coughs> Sorry, had they got caught up? Um, in a storm, had something gone terribly wrong in the wintering grounds. It was actually very distressing and very upsetting. And I think when you're going through times of great sadness and great frustration and great anxiety, those little things can actually trigger you far more than they would otherwise do. And I was really very emotionally invested in why these house martins had not returned. Uh, I started volunteering mostly for something to do to get out of the house. Um, with our local village delivering leaflets and things and one day in early May I think it was the 2nd of May it was a beautiful hot day you remember the summer that we had last year it, it was so warm and I was walking pushing Georgie in her push chair delivering these leaflets and it honestly it felt like a cloud was hanging over me the sky was blue um, the birds were singing it was glorious there were no cars anywhere no planes in the sky but I, I felt claustrophobic I felt like I wanted to scream, this, this sense of building anxiety was, was so intense. Um, as I was walking along, this sound caught my ear practically from the other side of the village. And as I walked, it got louder and louder and suddenly from nowhere around the corner of these barns, these swifts just went bombing through. And it was like this release. And I remember standing there and I actually shed a couple of tears because it, it was like the world was moving forward again. We weren't we weren't stuck. Actually, things were changing. Things that were beyond our power were going forward. And it was this great eruption of joy and happiness and these things that were so disconnected from all these tedious human concerns and these silly societal things that human, the messes that humans get themselves into. These swifts were just there and they were celebrating and racing around and it was just pure joy. About two minutes later, 
um, I looked up at them again and I saw that they'd been joined by another bird and it was a house martin. And that feeling of euphoria only intensified. As I walked back up our avenue, um, I saw the house martin checking out each of the individual houses and then finally coming in to the nest on our house to check it out, just as I was walking up the driveway. And that feeling of e ecstasy, I think, that we get when we see the firsts of things, when we, we can celebrate those little returns, we celebrate the return of the swift, the house martins, the swallows, uh, we celebrate the first time we hear a cuckoo, we celebrate the first time in the autumn where we see a red wing, a field fair. Uh, all of those things I think are so important for us as wildlife watchers that they almost become subconscious. But celebrating the little things that we find every single day is something that we all do. It's something that we all share, even if it's subconscious. And that house martin photo was taken very early in the morning, about I think 5.30 in the morning with the sun behind it coming up. And you can see how close the nest is to our window. And to sit for the next few weeks and just listen to the chatter of the parent birds and the young from last year coming in um, and then hearing the chicks as well after they hatched. It, it was something that I think saved us last summer and something that I'm sure so many of you will have found in your own lives. So I have related the fact that I'm a twitcher occasionally, not, not anywhere near as much as many people on this call I know, um, but I kind of get dragged along for the ride with Rob. Um, occasionally I have gone on my own where it's got a bit personal and a lot of the stories that I talk about in my column are to do with finding rarities and twitching. What I will say is there is no such thing as a best laid plan. They never come to pass, they don't work, they're absolutely awful. And there's no point getting hung up on whether the plan is going to work or not. Everyone I know that goes into a twitch with a plan never happens. It's far best to just let the rhythm take you and go with the flow. Um, I won't go through all of these stories in detail, but these are just some of the horrendous plans that have gone badly wrong um, over the past few years whilst I have been twitching. So this is the rock thrush um, that was in Wales a few years ago. Um, we had just come off Scilly. It was a glorious sunny time on Scilly. Uh, we'd just seen a yellow-billed cuckoo as we were leaving. Um, it had been a pretty good autumn all round actually for rare birds. There had been some great wildlife experiences. But this rock thrush was there in Wales and we were going to go on the way back. Wasn't it exciting? Wasn't it great? When you've spent three weeks in an island paradise where the temperature hasn't really dropped below 15 degrees, the Brecon Beacons is a bit of a shock, especially in gale force winds and with water pouring down. I do not think I've ever had such a torrential, horrendous twitch in my life. We drove up and down this little road trying to find where to park and eventually Rob rolled down the window and decided that he was going to ask the car where to park. Um, as we rolled down the window we realised the car we were talking to was a carload of five youths, none of which had a shred of hair on their heads between them and some of which had neck tattoos and had clearly figured out that there were quite a lot of birders with quite a lot of expensive kit parking in this small lay-by and leaving their cars unattended. Um, we just flagged that we were that audience, which wasn't the best thing to do probably. So then we sat in the car for ages wondering if we actually dared to leave. Uh, at this time it's absolutely pelting it down with rain. Another car turned up, our lovely friends Tim and Andrea, and Andrea announced that she wasn't getting out the car. So great, Andrea's guarding the cars, they're not going to try and break in with someone sitting there, that's fine. And they did actually drive off after that point. Um, but this is fine, um, Andrea's going to guard the cars and we're going to go see the bird. We tried to open the boot, the boot nearly got pulled off its hinges, the wind was that strong. We didn't have any wet weather gear with us particularly because we'd either left it on silly or um, we hadn't even bothered taking it frankly. Uh, so we were completely inappropriately dressed. It was hailing, sleeting, snowing, raining. We started walking down what we thought was the path and the path actually turned into a four inch stream about 300 yards down. We carry on going and eventually you get to these quarries uh, where there's all these different birds around and there was one lonely wheat ear and we got told to find the wheat ear because you'll find the mealworms then that have been put down for the rock thrush. The mealworms I think are dehydrated and come back to life 
the weather was that awful. We never found the wheat. We never found the mealworms. We did find the wheat here. And eventually we did see the rock thrush. But it was one of the most horrendous experiences of my life that nearly put me off twitching for life. This one's a little bit rubbing it in some people's faces, I know, and I feel a bit harsh about this one. Uh, the belted kingfisher was a bird that happened to rock up on Scilly when we were there. A very exciting moment. Um, and it, it led us on a merry dance throughout the entire day. If you followed that bird on the bird news channels, you'd think that this was a bird that was showing regularly once every hour and a half or so. It did not. It, it did not. About one person saw it at a time. Some of them were flyovers. Um, and at the time I was actually uh, four months pregnant. And this involved jumping over rocks, climbing up hills, running very fast on three occasions whilst four months pregnant was not fun. Um, at one point we jumped on a boat and skipped over to St Martin's to see a laughing gull instead because we'd become so disenchanted. And in the end, uh, we jumped in Joe Pender's Land Rover um, along with five other people in the back. This was not a tenable position for a four month pregnant lady. Um, it was actually probably quite dangerous. Um, and we were in the back of the Land Rover and he was going to drive us to the bird. He'd already seen it, jammy sod. And we drove up towards the nature reserve, towards um, Higher Moors and Port Ellic. And instead of turning off and parking, which we thought he was going to, we went whizzing straight past the end. And we we're like, well, what are you doing? Where are you going? And he basically off-roaded the entire way down Port Ellic Down. For anyone that's been on Scilly, quite an effort to do at the speed he was doing it. At one point, you're well beyond 45 degree turn. The dog nearly went through the windscreen. His wife was going hysterical, screaming at him, and I can't blame her at all. I didn't have a chair in the back of the Land Rover, so I was bouncing up and down, thinking if I was eight months pregnant, I would now be giving birth. He then didn't stop actually at the car park at the bottom, um, where some, some of the fishermen go. He literally drove the entire way along the beach, including, I think, driving over Sir Cloudly Shovel's grave at one point. Um, and pulled up in the midst of these birders, scattering telescopes, scattering binoculars everywhere. And I remember being the first one out of the car and um, getting on this in someone's scope. And we had it for no more than three minutes before gone. And one more person saw it after that. So it just shows sometimes I think you follow the bird news and you think, oh, yeah, this is a pretty easy bird. It's not. They never are easy birds. The rose-breasted grosbeak, for those of you who were on Silly a couple of years ago, you will know how personal this became. I was going to tell this story, but I'm aware of the time and frankly, it, it's just too hard for me to try and recount this. Basically, it's five days of my life that I'm never getting back, where I think everyone on Silly saw it, apart from six of us, um, through a string of catastrophic decisions on my part. Um, I had a young child, I was racing up and down in sand dunes. It all culminated um, with us going over to St Martin's as a family, um, with the idea being that my husband would look after Georgie if the bird turned up and um, I would go and see the bird and be able to run ahead. This is not what happened and this was a fatal decision almost on his part. Uh, he stopped to talk to someone as a consequence, didn't make it to the site we were going to. The bird was announced, the bird broke. He ran, leaving me with a baby that had just pooed her pants, frankly, a pushchair, a nappy bag and another pregnant lady uh, who were, we were both very stressed at this point. Um, we tried to keep up with everybody, but we couldn't. Everyone else took a shortcut down a very steep hill. We couldn't do that because we had pushchairs and things. So we had to go the long way around and we barreled into this field literally as the bird flew and I remember walking down the line of birders to find my husband who was having a moment of celebration that did not last and I literally had the nappy bag in my hand and I threw it in his face with a touch more force than was ladylike and he went to retaliate and get grumpy with me and a very well-known birder one of the highest listers in the UK very calmly put uh, his hand on Rob's shoulder and went, I think you should go and look after the baby. I think you should go and look after the baby as well. 
uh, unfortunately never did see that one and then also missed one this autumn so it has become the bogey bird um, it's a shame because that actually as you can see was a cracking photo by Jim Almond and a very nice bird to see congratulations to everyone here who did see it and this I've thrown in um, as a slight smug factor to make up for that uh, this is the indigo bunting that turned up um, literally the day after the rose-breasted grosbeak in 2020 uh, we'd spent the entire morning on goo it was freezing cold and horrible and rainy and as we walked back across the goo bar I insisted to my husband that I was going to the cafe on St Agnes to Coast Guard's cafe and I was having a toasty and a hot chocolate as we were walking up the hill his page of Megid and me being cocky thought I knew what it was which was a bird from earlier and I went oh no no you don't need to look at that and we went to the cafe and I ordered my toasty and I ordered my hot chocolate and someone casually said oh is there anything around and at that point he got out his pager and saw that there was an indigo bunting approximately a two minute run away and I don't think I've ever seen him look so grumpy or panicked and very sweetly the chap who had given me as who, who I'd got the toasty from actually drove it round so we kind of tell this rather smug story that oh we saw an indigo bunting but hands up we very nearly didn't see an indigo bunting if it had been up to me we would have been in the cafe eating toasties never mind um so crashing on number seven no pain no gain and I'm sure a lot of you will recognize this as well but what I'm actually talking about for me is badgers um, when I first started watching wildlife we went up to Agas Field Centre in the Highlands of Scotland which I'm sure some of you will have been to it's a magical place there's loads of pine martins and badgers and birds it's just it's just a cracking place to go and I'd never seen a badger before in the UK at this point I was in my early 20s I grew up in Leicestershire I mean how ridiculous is that I'd never seen a badger um, I was really looking forward uh, to seeing them and we got a hint that actually because it was so light late at night you could go and sit out on the lawn at 11 o'clock at night and there was a badger that came out onto the lawn and would feed on worms and stuff and if you were really quiet you could just sit and watch it uh, I followed all the instructions and I was sitting on the wall that was really low and I saw the badger come out I was completely on my own everyone else was like being sane and enjoying a drink um, whilst I stayed out there on my own the badger appeared and it got closer and closer and closer working its way across the lawn uh, had a tug of war with a worm at one point which was great and at this point there is a lot of midges on me um, it's making me itch even thinking about it they were crawling through my hair they were crawling up my arms they were inside my clothes uh, they were going down my wellies it was just it there was a lot of midges around that night it was completely still there was not a breath of wind and this badger just got closer and closer and closer obviously it couldn't smell me or it didn't care that I was there and within a few minutes it was literally within two or three feet of me so I obviously couldn't move to scratch my hair or anything else and I was just getting eaten alive I was so badly prepared it got closer and closer uh, it stopped right in front of me I, I couldn't breathe I couldn't move I was going mad um, and it actually lifted its head up and it sniffed my toe which slipped over the edge of the wall and I remember having this awful thought of oh goodness is BTB a thing up in Scotland <laughs> like, I'm going to get bitten by a badger and it's going to be awful but it was this beautiful creature it just sniffed my toe kind of shrugged its shoulders and carried on its merry way the next day I counted over 200 midge bites on me and that was not looking in my hair or anything else that was just all over my body and it was but no pain no gain you only get those experiences if you put up with a bit of discomfort so some things definitely come out of the blue and anyone who knows me um, will know how much I love being on boats and how much I love being um, on the sea it's a huge part of my life um, I would spend my entire life off on boats if I could do and if I didn't feel quite as queasy as I do in anything above a two meter sea uh, but I love the experience I love being on the waves I love the smells um, I love the birds I love the wildlife most of all though I love the cetaceans um, I love these amazing experiences that we have uh, with cetaceans when we're out on the boat and anyone who's ever seen me out on the boats on Scilly um, hanging over the edge of sapphire will know that I'm practically in the water with them um, hanging right over you can almost touch them with your fingertips as the boat's driving along and the first time this ever happened uh, I was out on the front of the boat and we ended up with 300 common dolphins all around us 
um, they were all the way out to the horizon. They were bow riding and that experience must have lasted 20, 30 minutes. Um, common dolphins are something that most people can enjoy in the UK. It's not particularly expensive to get a trip out to see them, but they are this absolutely insane creature, this hugely muscular creature. They're so powerful. And they're also the same, same family as whales. So they also have that human connection with us. They make eye contact with you. Um, they interact with you. They're, they're kind of looking up at you and going, who's this insane person? Why is she hanging off the edge of our boat as we're bow riding? Uh, they're just so much fun to be around and it's this incredible experience. Don't know if this is going to work, fingers crossed. But even better than the common dolphins, um, this year, oh, it's a bit jumpy. I don't know if this will work, it's a bit jumpy. Um, I'm going to pause that because it's going to freeze me and it's going to freeze everybody else as well. Uh, this year, um, it was Christmas Eve and um, we were on Tresco waiting to go back to St Mary's and we got a text to say that there was a report of a humpback whale, not just around Scilly, but actually in between the islands. No one could believe it. The fishermen couldn't believe it. The boatmen couldn't believe it. No one could believe that a whale of that size could be between the islands. Um, luckily, our lovely boatman, Paul Osborne, um, had seen something that he thought was it and he very quickly managed to get another boat service onto it. They kept track of this animal and Paul took us out on Christmas Eve evening. We were meant to be going to the pub but instead we ended up on this impromptu whale watching trip uh, just off the garrison, um, just beneath Samson as well. Um, with this incredible humpback whale. I've seen humpbacks off the east coast of America. I've seen a humpback whale off the coast of Devon, but never did I think I would have this experience where I would see the fluke of a humpback whale coming up. And I skip forward. Um, oh, it's not working. I'm so sorry. I was hoping my video would work, but it won't. Um, it, it was this absolutely incredible thing to just be a part of everyone on silly turned out over the next few days there was chats constantly on the facebook groups where's the whale who's seen the whale is there more than one whale a few days later we had fin whales there were sightings all around the islands it was this incredible like a celebrity had rocked up um to make our christmas and to make it even worse we were in tier one so we were the only place that could go to the pub as well so we did have a little bit of the smog factor going on with humpback whales and a pint. But it was a very exciting moment for the entire island and one that was completely unexpected. Like I said, the boatmen, the fishermen, they didn't even know this was going to happen. They, they would not in their wildest dreams have thought of a humpback whale healthy feeding in between the islands. It's actually a suspicion now that there were at least two there. Um, some reports are going as high as four or five. Which I'm a little sceptical of. Um, I think it was probably the same whales being reported but I do think there are at least two there. And the great thing is we've actually just found out today that at least one of them is still there, which is marvelous that it's managed to be, it's managing to get enough food. Um, it's managing to survive there quite happily. These are animals that are migrating uh, down to the warmer waters uh, south of us, um, what, migrating down to the tropics, hopefully. Uh, but if it's getting enough food and it's happy and it's comfortable, then it's somewhere with zero disturbance at the moment because there's virtually no boating going on. And it's still providing this amazing opportunity for Salonian and Islanders uh, to get close to nature. And people who I never would have thought would have cared about something like that. We were all obsessed. It was the shared community. The news picked up on it, which was lovely. But more than anything, it was just chatting to people in the street uh, over Christmas, on Christmas Day, all the way up to New Year, about our whale, which was lovely. So my number nine, marital disputes are inevitable, um, as I'm sure many of you have found in your own wildlife watching experiences. Uh, we're not proper wildlife watchers unless we've nearly got divorced over wildlife. And I wonder how many of you had the same experiences with Siberian ascenters. We were on Silly when this happened and I am going to read this one directly because it happened a few years ago and I have a blow by blow account of what happened. 9th of October, first day on Silly. Lovely time, friendly faces, nice autumn migrants, optimism. Q mega alert. Siberian Ascenter, Shetland, 
a first for Britain. Groans all round, but no matter, we don't twitch from silly. 13th of October, bit slow, good tea rooms. We won the quiz at the Atlantic the night before. Birders team won £500 on the bonus, jammy gits. That was actually a Leicestershire team as well. 14th of October, another mega alert. Siberian Ascenta, Easington, swearing, no matter. No boat availability until, until Friday. Several twitchers at this point described Silly as Alcatraz because no one could leave. 15th of October, Ascenta still at Easington. Photographs of queues stretching for miles, birders celebrating, birds showing at point blank range. Dejected, the birders football team arrived on the Salonian 3. Mega alert, Siberian Ascenta in Cleveland, many crack. More than 40 birders abandoned the island. All conversation was dominated by the Cybac, tempers fraying. I've told you, you can go, was said for the hundredth time by me to him. 16th of October, it's still there. Mega alert for the third morning in a row. Pager almost thrown in the sea. Birders lost 4-1 to the silly football team. Ouch. We were assumed that they were distracted. 17th of October, bird still there, sapphire pelagic, promised a maximum of six foot swell closer to 12, the only proper time I have experienced seasickness. 18th of October, bird still there, mega alert, Siberian Ascenter in Northumberland, Easington bird still there, few remaining silly birders stomping around determinedly trying to find their own, others are sobbing into pints, Twitter banned in our household due to the sulking that it induces. Announcement that 97% of British birders have seen a Siberian Ascenta. We are the 3%. 19th of October, Ascenta is gone from Easington, 400 miles to the southwest. We stay put. 21st of October, possible first for Britain, pale legged leaf warbler on St Agnes. Flies into the window before it's seen or identified, showing well in the Turk's head afterwards. 22nd of October, leave Silly, many vowing never to return. They all came back though. 25th of October, Siberian Ascenter on Holy Island, Northumberland. 26th of October, husband cracks, heads off with a BTO team early in the morning. They meet other birders who missed the Easington bird and compare travel diaries. All were away in mid-October. Silly, Corvo, Szechuan, the Moluccas Islands, but no sign on Holy Island. They got trapped the entire day by the tide. Ha ha. 29th of October, mega alert, Siberian Ascenta, Northumberland again, in area with no general access. Husband proclaims, what have I done to deserve this? 30th of October, we headed north anyway to see the Isabeline Shrike. We arrived at the Ascenta site just in case and follow the very unofficial directions. If anyone asks, you're looking for a golf ball, we were told. We will risk incarceration at this point, it's that or divorce. There's a 30 centimetre gap in the metal fence that we have to squeeze through. It's a bit tricky for some, especially one chap who went in before all of us and did get stuck for 30 seconds and pretty much got kicked out the other side by one very well-known birder who was getting a bit desperate. We were working hard for this, Bird wasn't on view, but a stoat was running round. Someone actually picked up a rock at that point, just in case. Stress building. Then following weeks of patience, trials and tribulation, the bird appears. What a beauty. Sighs and gasps of relief all round. Good things come to those who wait. And just to prove my point, this is the T-shirt that was made of the Siberian Ascenters. And you can see that we were the penultimate Siberian Ascenter in the invasion. We really did cut it fine. My final piece is more romantic. And again, I hope it's something you relate to. I believe that nature is something that where you lose yourself and you find yourself both physically and emotionally. Um, many of you will know at the moment that part of the Suffolk coast is being proposed as an extension to Sizewell B. They're now looking to build Sizewell C and the development directly abuts um, Minsmere RSPB. It literally goes right up to the boundary fence. If the actual building itself has been designed relatively environmentally friendly, it, it, it will blend with the landscape when it's done. 
But what is less talked about is the temporary accommodation that's going up for 3,000 workers, uh, in the four or five fields that are being concreted over to create new car parks at the train station nearby, um, at the enormous road construction that's having to be built to accommodate all of the lorries, etc., that need to act, that are needed to make Sizewell C. If any of you have ever had dinner in the Eels Foot Inn, do not expect the same view as you have been used to if size well C goes ahead. It is a terrifying construction in that respect and will fundamentally change the way that we view RSPB Minsmere for the worst. The RSPB and Suffolk Wildlife Trust have now got over 100,000 signatures on their petition, but with the current government drive for build, 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 economy, 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 this is something I personally am very scared of and I will be deeply saddened if it goes ahead. Um, just because of all of those different things, it's not just about Minsmere, RSPB, it's all of the things that are going with it, regardless of your view on nuclear energy. I had this amazing experience um, at Minsmere a few years ago um, that I will share with you now. It's my last story, I swear. Imagine you're walking along a path that leads um, from a vast and swaying rebed an hour or so before sunset. This is a landscape shaped by man. It may seem wild, but this is part of the Suffolk coast carefully managed for people and wildlife. As a stark reminder of our continual human impact, a nuclear power station broods in the background in harsh juxtaposition with the gentle landscape. Its boxy shape and white dome contrasting with the natural curves and undulations of the coast, the cliffs and these famous nature reserves. This is the season when the stage is set for the coming year sorting the genetic lines that will survive, reproduce and prosper, and those that will fall by the wayside. Hobbies are snapping dragonflies off the surface of the water, whilst marsh harriers sweep the tops of the reed bed, passing food to their mates in a spectacular aerial display. Swifts and sand martins wheel against the darkening sky, and all around the woods are alive with the rustling of unseen birds. Chaffinches, robins, wrens, blue tits, blackbirds, blackcaps, white throats, laired with the frenetic outbursts of chetties, sedge and reed warblers. Underpinning them all on the base, the booming of the bittern reverberates in the air and sends vibrations into the stomach of everyone that hears. Crows and jackdaws call their harsh, uncouth tones, and the yaffling of the green woodpecker adds a comical twist. The sun is sinking over the reeds. The final visitors, families and couples are strolling back to their cars. They are bathed in the golden light coming from the west. To the east, waves crash on the shingle beach and turns dive for tiny silver fish. Gulls are crying harshly to one another, whilst on the marsh avocets clucked clucked. They may be beautiful birds with their striking elegant and black plumage, but in reality they're bullies. Pity any wader who strays too close to an avocet to be quickly and viciously driven off. The reeling of a grasshopper warbler, sounding uncannily like the whirring of a fishing line being fast let out, starts up. He can't be seen, but you can imagine his little head turning slowly and smoothly side to side. The sun is sinking over the marsh. A little way down the road, the same woodland and grassland birds are in mid-song, only the reed bed and marshland dwellers are no longer heard. Instead, the shadows lengthen, and the forlorn and lonely cuckoo repeats his plaintive yet hauntingly beautiful name, sending shivers up your spine and setting goosebumps at the back of your neck. He is calling out, but no one is answering. Not yet, anyway. He's the first back, but in a few weeks, both rivals and lovers will return to take their place in the mating season. The sun is sinking over the heathland. The dulcet tones of the cuckoo are interrupted by a swift and throaty cackle from the nearby gorse. This new sound comes in fits, it comes in fits and starts, as though warming up for a long and complex performance. Then as the calls of the warblers and tits and finches lessen and grow faint, the nightingale takes his place and shatters the stillness of the evening with his continuous crescendo of warbling, chirruping, rasping, snapping, whistling, squealing, clucking and clicking. He's a great pretender, taking pride in the unpredictability of his voice, challenging and in imitating his adversaries, relentless and untiring. The most you'll see is a silhouette, a shadow, an outline. He lives to be admired for his song alone. The sun is sinking over the gorse. From over the nearby plantation comes a deeper, more nasal call, the unmistakable grunt of a roving woodcock as he circles above the treetops. This complements the rough bark of a dog fox and contrasts with the gentle mewling of one, no two, little owls in amicable conversation. Then at first unrecognisable, as it's so rarely heard, the high-pitched tones of the wailing stone curlew, a banshee. Still the nightingale continues his serenade, barely pausing, 
whilst the echoes of the cuckoo remain. And then to add one last dimension, the purring of a now rare and elusive turtle dove briefly caresses the air. The sun is sinking over the woodlands. I don't think any artist using the subtlest brush strokes and the softest of hues could capture the rich colours and sounds and scents of the evening. Is there a poet who could fit the rhythms and beats of randomness to the rigidity of a sonnet or haiku, even with the cleverest metaphors? No orchestra could mimic the mellow simplicity and the startling complexity of this unrehearsed yet harmonised soundtrack. The sun has set on this Suffolk spring evening. Thank you very much for listening. This is my book. I've already talked about that, so I won't plug it again. I'm happy to take any questions. I'm also happy to direct them to more knowledgeable people in the audience who I know are there. Um, and one final thing, just to give a big plug for Leicestershire and Rutland Wildlife Trust. Um, they are putting on all of these talks for free, but if you can donate even just a pound or two, um, that really goes a long way towards helping the cost of these. It takes staff time behind the scenes to set them up, to manage all of us unpredictable speakers, to run the websites, etc. So any money that you can give to any talks that you attend throughout lockdown is very gratefully received and will be very well spent on local conservation projects. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we're going to have some questions. I'm not sure if it's... Yeah, um, Jane, can you um, see... Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. There's, there, there is a few questions and a few comments, so if you can just run through them for us, can you? I will if I can, just bear with me a second. Okay. <laughs> the technology. In fact, the, the first question is from our Bruce. <laughs> the, the question I suspect you may well have already answered, but there may be some additions. Bruce says, pre-COVID, where did you go birding? Oh, we uh, went. So far, we've heard of everywhere. Yeah, yeah. I, I, <laughs> I should have to add. Yeah, I should have added there locally. Locally, fine. Yeah. So my local patch is Holwell Nature Reserve uh, near Melton Mowbray. I absolutely love Holwell. It's full of green woodpeckers and um, marsh tits, which were really exciting when I saw my first marsh tits there. Yeah. And you get some great woodland birds. It's like the nearest spot to me for seeing nut hatches. At the moment, I'm doing a lot of patch birding which my husband is cringing a lot about but coming back very ridiculously excited about jays and missile thrushes at the moment um, and feeling very smug that I managed to see them on my daily run but no I absolutely love Holwell Nature Reserve locally we go to Rutland Water two or three times a year and we'll pop over to the Norfolk coast which is only about 70 miles away or so um, and also I mean I grew up in Market Bosworth so all of the area around there. I love walking the country lanes there and seeing the yellow hammers and reed buntings and things like that. So a whole variety of places, but yes, Holwell is my local. Okay, okay thank you. The, there's a comment from Suzanne Moss um, saying that's such a powerful story, Lucy. And I think that was about the, the whale, the dead whale. Yeah. Um, a question from Carl. Given the superb modern filming techniques as we have become used to on TV, do you think we give an over expectation to young people regarding wildlife watching? Oh, that is a very good question. Um, I think yes and no. M my concern doesn't lie with children as such, because I mean, my um, child is just over two years old and we watch a lot of CBBS together and watching the nature programs on CBBS actually is great for kids. There's loads of stuff on there and I sit there learning so much. I mean, the Octonauts, oh my goodness, so much learned from that program. Um, it's actually really interesting. And there's like the go jetters, which are talking about climate change and stuff. It's great. So I think for young kids, it's not really an issue. I see more of an issue for older kids um, who see these amazing experiences and not only think oh I, I, I want to have that experience but they think oh I can do that for a job and you think oh no and what we've ended up with is this generation of people who all want to be wildlife filmmakers and all want to be the next David Attenborough and whilst that is a very admirable job to want to do there simply aren't enough jobs for the amount of people who want to do them it's an incredibly competitive industry uh, there's loads of people trying to 
get into this and only a handful of people make it every few years. So I think the un unrealistic expectations happens on two levels. On one, I think it's that people do have this view of wildlife that it's showy and it bounces around. <clears throat> and as we know, that's quite often not what happens. Um, I, I think it, you really have to focus in on the little things like the insects and the flowers and things to get kids really hooked in and to manage their <laughs> expectations. Um, but I do think that it then becomes this kind of ambition that that's going to be my job and it, it doesn't pay very well and it's really hard and arduous and you probably can't hold down a relationship if you do it and I, I think that is a conversation for another time but I do think that is an issue with managing the expectations of young people nowadays who have grown up watching David Attenborough and think oh I really want to be the drone photographer that films that humpback whale sequence as they're lunge feeding and you're thinking oh no not another one we can't all do it <clears throat> and then we've got some various positive comments and um, one more question from Suzanne Moss how is Georgie loving nature <laughs> um she actually I think likes it more than I do at times um she's very into exploring now so everything is picked up and pointed at um We've tried to break her down into different bird names now and she can kind of do it. But we pointed out a hoopoo on in the night garden earlier. And I said, Georgie, can you say hoopoo? And she went, birdie. And I was like, oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Obviously, I was wrong. Um, so she has quite strict ideas at the moment of what things are. But she's getting very excited about the starlings that are sitting on the wires outside the house. She just wants to be outside freezing cold a few days ago. And she was banging on the window like let me outside and I'm going oh I don't want to go outside it's freezing I want to sit inside and watch Frozen 2 again and eat popcorn with the fire on uh, and she wasn't having any of it she dragged me out there and we have a great time when we're out but she ran she, the other day to make me go outside she ran outside with no shoes on in the snow in her pajamas just to prove a point I was like oh she's getting quite stubborn. <laughs> thank you very much Lucy that's the end of the questions. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Jane. Um, oh, Lucy, can you um, stop your screen share?